from the creative point of view, then there's a whole lot you can do without any fancy equipment. Um, I'm just kind of going to go through these a little bit because you are going to get this handout anyway and all these little notes are in there. But the whole thing is that you want to create a strong focal point. So whatever you're photographing um, and whatever style you're photographing it in, <clears throat> you need to make sure that the light is right on your product and that everything else is just there to complement it. So in this one here, it's a really soft background. We were trying to give, um, the, the, the product is called Pure Butter. Um, so it helps on the product to look nice. That's always good. So you guys are already off to a good start. Um, but basically we wanted to do something that, that echoed that kind of idea of purity, of, um, of, of freshness, of things like that. So we went with lovely white flowers um, and all kind of arranged around. Nothing distracts from it. It's drawn the eye right in. This works well center framing. If you're doing a flat lay, generally it's going to work better if your subject is in or near the middle. If it's off to one side, then people will be drawn away from it a little bit. So if you're going flat lay, it generally tends to work a little bit better to get your subject right in the middle. But your focal point is just where you're focusing on. So what do you want someone to look at? Whenever you look at that photo, you don't tell me that's a photo of flowers with a tin in the middle. You tell me that's a photo of, of the Mango Girl Pure Butter. And that's the whole idea. You want people to know exactly where to look. Um, you want to avoid clutter. Um, like I was saying as we were going through there, don't throw everything at it. So getting a few bits and pieces in are a good idea. Um, this was a shoot for Craft and I where we were trying to show off the napkins and the wickerware. Um, on their own, they didn't really make, they, they're beautiful handmade pieces. We wanted to show the detail and the quality of them, but we also wanted to show what they were for because they looked a little bit, if they were just on a wooden background on their own, they looked a little bit sort of lost. So that's why we've got the little eggs in the basket. The eggs themselves all arranged with like to face a certain way because uh, I'm a wee bit OCD and I'm um, like lines facing it and all um, and just showing off these textures and lovely soft colours. That was all that image needed. It didn't need loads more. Um, so we left it out. And that's a really important thing. Don't get carried away. Think about things. Start with your product. Maybe look at ingredients or process or what you use to make it or tools or things like that and add those in and build upon it. But if you, it's like that sort of Coco Chanel phrase, isn't it? Like the last accessory you put on, you should take off. Kind of the same applies for editorial and flat light photography. Don't just throw everything at it because people won't know where to look. When I talk about clutter, I mean like your backgrounds as well, but I'm going to come back to that. When you are framing your image, you also want to think about what you're leaving in and what you're leaving out. So the temptation with flat light can be to go really wide and get loads and loads in and get all of everything in but then things get lost and there's a lot of empty space. So don't be afraid to go a little bit closer in to show the details on things with just little bits kind of popping in around the side so that you're kind of looking at what you're getting in there as well as what you're getting out. If you're doing kind of isolated product shots um, as well, then you can show the full product in those and don't be afraid to go closer in on some of your photos just to show the detail as well. People really like to see that because it shows the quality of things. And especially if something's handmade, it shows people the textures and the kind of detail that they love to see. If you're going macro, then your focus is the most important thing. <clears throat> so um, you will be limited to an extent by the camera kit you've got. It depends on what you've got. As a kind of general guide, most cameras about a hand's distance away. I'm going to do that the other way because check out my manicure. I was working in the garden. <laughs> um, about six inches away or hand's distance away tends to be a good starting point for a macro shot. But that will vary drastically depending on your camera and the subject that you're focusing on. What you really want to do is get to as close as you can and don't push it. Don't take it any further. When you start to see the soft line coming in, stay back a little bit. And then you can crop your photo afterwards. That's going to get you a sharper shot. Lack of focus is the one thing you can't fix. Um, so it's a case of getting it lovely and sharp and showing off those details. With things like this as well, you have to be really, really careful. Uh, if you're doing macros or close-ups, keep your flash off. It will white out your details and it will just bounce back off things. So make sure that's turned off. There should be a little option somewhere on any device to um, like a lightning bolt with a no entry sign over it, which will allow you to turn flash off. So that's really useful. And I'm going to chat a bit about how you can work with lower light if you don't have the flash on as well. And then as well, uh, that can be really, really useful. If you are getting really close in um, and you need to use a tripod or something like that just to get it steady, you can buy them and they're not expensive at all. So also worth doing. And experimenting with it is really important. So see when you're all set up, see when you've gone to the effort of setting up your paper background or your fabric background and getting all your props and all, don't just take one or two photos, take loads. Um, you guys are all busy. You're going to try and get into a workflow of it. 
<clears throat> so what you find is going to be your best bet is if you're all set up and you have a really lovely light organized, then photograph loads of things in one go and get through them. Keep them all backed up and ready to go. When you get a chance, edit them, and then you're going to have a backlog of shots to work through. Um, speaking from experience myself, um, my Instagram and social media is always really, really good when work is quiet. And then when I get back to work, uh, I drop off the face of the earth because I don't have time to do it. I'm trying to fix that um, by using scheduling tools, things like Planoli and later and having a little bit of a backlog kind of saved up. But my photos would tend to be photos I've taken for other people. So therefore it's then when that dries up, it goes quiet and I have to do more stuff. So yes, yeah, so it's a good idea to kind of have a little backlog, make your workflow as easy as possible. There's no point taking one photo and then putting it right away and then having to set it all back out again. Uh, 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 with your backgrounds as well, you should pay as much attention to your background as you do your subject. It will entirely set the feel for what you're going for. Um, so this kind of lovely wood piece, generally I would actually, so normally I would say no to like patterns in the background, but for this one, it just kind of worked because the colors looked really nice. It was soft enough that it didn't impose on the photo and it didn't sort of distract from the subject. And the soft, flat, matte background kind of emphasized the sheen and the detail in the wood. So look at your background as part of your photo and be like, right, what, what mood do I want to set here? Dark backgrounds tend to look a little bit more dramatic. Light backgrounds tend to look fresh and boost color. Um, you can use tones to like give the idea of luxury or you can use textures to give the idea of rustic or really kind of clinical. I mean, it, it varies from product to product. So what you would want if you're making something to sell um, as like a cleaning product is going to be very different from if you're making something to sell that is a piece of art. But you can use your background to really change the feel of your photos. And colour is really important as well. Um, you've got opposite colours which are also known as complementary colors. And that is just colors opposite each other on the color wheel. So reds against greens, blues against yellows, basically cool against warm colors will make each other pop and look more vibrant. So you can see here, this looks really vivid. The colors really stand out um, and it makes the colors kind of pop. On the other hand, this one is an example of analogous colors. So that is colors that are beside each other on the color wheel. So all your warm tones together, all your cool tones together. In this one, it's earthy tones. It's browns and reds and warmth and, and it works across the board and it looks really nice. So they give you more of a kind of, just a little bit more of an atmospheric kind of subtle feel. You'll see a lot of this on Instagram layouts. Um, if you use like hashtag looks like film and things like that, you'll see it used a lot in portraits. Um, it tends to be very fashionable uh, in photography now. Um, obviously, if you're selling an art piece where colour is important, you want the colour to accurately reflect and you want the background colours and the colours that you're using together to look well. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about that too. Um, with the colour thing, you can see here, so this is just um, two products, two of the exact same product shot in the same background. All I've really changed, the light is the same as well. All I've really changed is the colors around the edges and it gives you a totally different feel. So that's just a couple of pops of leaves uh, and the thing around them is the same again as leaves as well, but it just totally changes the feel of the image. So that's really, really important. So whatever you play with your colors, you'll see different things that will work. This is quite a nice idea if you're creating a brand, like an online brand or an online presence, is to use maybe little bits of color that are through all your photos little subtle things like that, like elements of framing, little bits of colour, tones that you use, light that you use, things like that can give your photos a look that will become yours and it means that everything looks consistent and looks really good. So that can be a really useful way to kind of play with it. With regards to colour, because when you're selling online, colour is really important. And the problem is, is that everybody's screen looks slightly different. So if I look at my photos on, I have three different computers in here and um, like iPhones, well, I don't have an iPhone, I have a, I, I have a tablet. I've never owned an iPad, um, but I've got like a wee, wee small one. Um, and it's, um, they all look different. So across the board, they will all look different. So the thing is, if you're selling stuff online from photos, everybody's screen will look slightly different. So that's worth mentioning. Um, if your color is important to say, there may be slight variations, but you want to get the most accurate shots possible that you can to show the color off, especially in those, um, those flat sort of white background shots. It has to be really, really accurate. And the way you do this on your camera is using a thing called white balance. Your white balance will be somewhere in your camera menu. On digital SLRs, it tends to be in the settings menu. 
So on Nikon's, you would hit the info button and look for one that says WB or AWB for auto. Uh, that's usually the default. Uh, on Canon, it will be in the quick menu, the Q menu button. Uh, on Sony's and things like that, it will be in your camera settings menu. Uh, on the phones, it will generally be in the pro mode only. And basically, whenever you use different types of light, you get different types of photos. Um, I'm in here at the minute. I've got a little bit of a mix of light going on at the minute. So I've got like a warm kind of bulb above and beside me. And then I've got the cool light coming from a screen light, like an LED light in front of me. So a little bit of a mix of color tones. Um, but basically, you can see here, um, your light is measuring degrees Kelvin. And when we look at something, our brain figures out what color it's meant to be and makes a fairly good stab at it. I'm sure there is somebody who can explain that way better than me, but I am not a scientist. Um, but basically, different light will reflect back off your products and it will make them look different. Your white balance is really important because it allows you to fine tune this and control it. Now, it's measured in degrees Kelvin, but there will be default settings in your camera. You will find options for daylight, shade, cloudy. They all throw a little bit more yellow in to warm things up. Tungsten would be for really warm interior light. So older bulbs, candles, things like that. Throws a lot of blue in. If your colours ever look really, really off, then generally it means your white balance is out and you need to figure that out. Um, I tend to shoot raw files. So if you're on a digital SLR, the best advice I could give you for white balance is to shoot raw so that you can fine tune it afterwards. But that does involve editing your photos afterwards. You can't use them straight off camera. If you are shooting um, JPEG or shooting on a phone, you'll be able to adjust it looking at the screen. And what you want to do is get something in your shot that you know is going to be a completely neutral color. Um, you can use a gray card for this. You can buy a thing called a gray card um, that has a certain level of gray. So it neutralizes the white balance. So what you would do is basically set your camera up in the exact light that you're going to be using. Throw your, this is a white card. I don't have my gray card here, but throw your, your gray card in. Take a photo of it, put it in the middle, read your degrees Kelvin for your light, make sure that you're happy with your white balance, um, fine tune it so it's perfect and it matches, and then you can lock that setting and shoot from there. If you're photographing on a white background, generally the camera will do a pretty good job of it because it's got white behind. Likewise for black. Um, if you have a little bit of issues in it where the camera maybe sort of gets it a little bit wrong, generally you can go in afterwards and fine tune it as well. So. What I find is a really good idea is if you're shooting something and you don't want to have that white, gray or black in there, but you do want to get your colors really, really good, have them just to the edge of the frame, just kind of overlapping in a little bit. Go in whenever you're editing your white balance and then um, click on that area to set as your neutral point, as your white balance point. And that will level out your light for you. So it's really, really useful. Most of the time I tend to shoot on auto white balance. It tends to be pretty good. The only time I tend to sort of find that it tends to get thrown a little bit is if I do something like maybe this, where I've got a bright blue background, the camera thinks that's wrong and will try to correct it by throwing yellow in. In this case, it kind of worked quite well because it gave me nice warm tones. But if I was a printmaker or a painter, I want my, my photos to look like what my stuff actually looks like. So that's really worth kind of doing and playing about with. Um, there's a little bit more about it in there for you guys, um, but we will send that over. And then the other thing is using light as well. So depending on what where you shoot is both basically the most important thing here. Pretty much to get nice product shots, all you really want is a nice soft light coming in. So either a north facing window, um, a conservatory, dream, build a conservatory, <laughs> um, a south facing window with um, some very high tech, either thin net curtains, you can buy diffuser panels or you can stick some tracing paper up there. Any of these things that will work because they will soften light and they will cut down glare points and burnt out highlights. So all of these will work. Moving your subject further away from the light will soften the light on it. Moving around the way you shoot and turning things around will sort of change the way you suit as well. That's all well and good if your object is something small and something you can move. Obviously, it won't always be. But the easiest and handiest way to do it is if you can move around because you'll see here, Looking at my wee face for a moment. As I move the camera and the thing around, I get totally different light. Oh, that's terrible. Look at those eye bags. Um, if I go back around, it gets much softer and much nicer with a little bit of contrast. And that's what you want to show off texture. Um, so it's all about where the light is hitting your subject and where the shadows fall. As I said before, you can really control this by using either a shadow card. So if you pay attention to this side of my face, you'll see there that removes the brightness there soften things down. It's literally just using a piece of black card. If I wanted to bounce light in here, 
and a white card on this side will make a big difference as well. You'll see that just breathing the light in and you move that wherever you want to. If you're doing like smaller products and things like that, make yourself a V out of white card and stick it around and it will bounce the light back in for you. So you don't need very fancy equipment to do this. You can buy little reflectors and things as well that will do it for you too. Um, but simple white card for bouncing in light, black card for adding shadows will make a huge difference. And that's what photographers basically use fancier versions of that to bounce the light in.